Hi everyone, and welcome to another video. Today, I want to look at how John Williams creates soaring string textures using simple octave doublings. Doubling a string melody up or down by an octave using some combination of violins one and two, violas and cellos, is a great way to strengthen the line so that it can be effectively heard through a full orchestral texture. And it can also give the music a feeling of weightlessness or of taking flight. But it's important to know when to use octave doublings and when instead to use unisons or to not double at all. So let's take a look at four iconic John Williams scores to find out. I'll be analyzing the following themes, looking specifically at how they're scored for strings. The first is Fox the Phoenix from Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. I'll discuss what makes a great soaring string melody, looking specifically at register and contour. Second is Anakin's theme from Star Wars The Phantom Menace. I'll look at how Williams considers orchestrational form to help create a compelling theme over the course of an entire three-minute piece. Third, I'll look at the love theme, Can You Read My Mind from Superman, to see how the timbre of a soaring string melody depends on register and doublings, either unison or at the octave. And finally, I'll look at the flying theme from E.T. to discuss strategies for scoring your own soaring string melody. You may have noticed a few patterns and common features to each of those themes. Even before discussing orchestration, it's helpful to know what kind of melody or theme may work best. Let's return to this theme. A memorable feature of this melody, and many of William's soaring melodies, is the melodic contour, and most importantly, this large ascending leap of an octave. Interval leaps of a fifth or more stand out within a theme, especially when surrounded by mostly stepwise motion or smaller interval leaps. And part of what gives this theme and others like it a sense of weightlessness or soaring is an emphasis on ascending motion. I like to think of it as going against gravity. The first phrase captures that feeling so well, moving up either with stepwise motion or through ascending leaps. This particular melody has an opening phrase that spans a minor 10th interval, which is a decently sized melodic range. And if you look at the entire seven measures, the complete interval range is an octave plus a sixth, which is getting fairly large, especially when you consider that many instruments' ranges, as well as most vocal ranges, are limited to about two octaves. Strings, however, have such an expansive range, and these types of melodies take advantage of that. Here are the practical orchestral ranges for violins, violas, and cellos. I'm not including basses. As far as I know, Williams never uses basses on these types of melodies. These three instruments have roughly a four octave range each, and together they cover over five octaves in total. Looking closer at the cello, I'll divide their complete range of playable notes into three sections. I'm gonna use vocal range terminology because the way we hear register is very much tied to how we hear the human voice. And there are very convenient names of different vocal ranges, like bass, baritone, tenor, alto, and soprano. For cello, I'm calling the lowest octave or so the bass range. These are notes that most often are played by bass instruments, 
and rarely used in fully orchestrated lyrical melodies. The majority of the time, if cellos are playing a soaring melody, either alone or when doubling another instrument, they will play within this middle section, what I've labeled the tenor or baritone range. And above that range, the cello can play the soprano register notes, but typically not on soaring string melodies. Just to clarify, these aren't strict divisions of each instrument's register. These are just meant to show how the instruments are typically used in Williams's orchestrations. And there will always be some exceptions and some overlap. Moving on to violas, violas are capable of a somewhat hybrid role in the string section. They can play in a quasi tenor range on lyrical soaring melodies, but most of the time they'll play within an alto or mezzo soprano register. And occasionally they'll play up really high, usually with violins on what I'm calling the sopranino register, although there's really not a good vocal term for these notes. Violins are most likely playing lyrical soaring melodies in either this soprano register, or as you'll see in this video, quite often in their highest octave. Occasionally a soaring theme will dip down into their lowest octave, but typically only when the overall orchestral texture is thinner or much quieter. The first statement of the theme in Fox the Phoenix is in A major, scored for cellos. You can see that placing this transposition of the theme in the cello section is a great option, because the entire melody falls within the middle register of the cello, which is perfect for that cantabile, lyrical, expressive, thematic writing. In the same octave, violas could play this theme as well. However, a portion of it would be at the bottom of their range, which has a much darker timbre. That would be okay for doubling with cellos to add some strength, but not as effective if they're playing on their own in that range. Here's what it would sound like with cellos and violas in unison. If I instead move the violas up by an octave, they're now in a register that's more effective at playing this kind of soaring melody. You can see on the left that the melody falls registrally almost entirely within the alto register for the violas, which is very useful for strengthening the theme, especially when sandwiched between cellos below and violins above. I've placed the first violins an octave above violas, so you can see now that the theme can be doubled over three adjacent octaves, and that each section, whether it's cellos, violas, or violins, can be playing in an effective register. More so than the other instruments, violins are extremely effective at playing these types of themes near the top of its range, which is the case here. Let's now see how this theme is actually scored for strings. Later in the Fox the Phoenix track, the theme is transposed down a whole step to G, and you can see now second violins are present as well, playing at unison with violas in that middle octave. Here's how that sounds. A typical John Williams soaring string melody will appear many times throughout a track or cue, and it's rarely scored the exact same way each time. In the track Anakin's theme, Williams helps support the musical narrative and form by considering how the orchestration evolves over time. Here I'm showing the MIDI data for the violins, violas, and cellos for the entire cue. You can sort of tell that there's a registral shape with the peak 
happening about two-thirds of the way through the piece. This MIDI data is showing not only melodic moments, but also all the accompanimental figures and non-melodic textures. So if I just show the moments where any of the four string sections are playing just the theme, then you can more clearly see how the orchestral form is effectively constructed. The theme is introduced in the first violins early in the cue. After a section of the music with a secondary theme, the main theme returns with first violins and cellos in octave below, just for a few measures. As the melodic line ascends right here, the lower octave of the theme transfers from cellos to second violins. If you remember the vocal ranges that I talked about, the line would have ascended past the typical soaring cello register. So transferring to second violins, even if just for a measure, is effective here. This bit of music builds and transitions into the big statement of the theme, spanning four octaves for a measure, and then three octaves after the cellos move to a more of an accompanimental role. Finally, at the end of the piece, the first violins play the melody once again alone, which completes this really nice formal arc for the entire piece. One that starts soft and registerly low, then expands in register and density two-thirds of the way through, and then thins out for a soft ending. By waiting until a few minutes into the piece to finally reveal that fortissimo three or four octave version of the theme, Williams creates a very emotional and dramatic journey for the listener. The most difficult decision when orchestrating soaring strings is to know just when to use octaves and when to use unisons or some combination of unison doubles and octaves. Can You Read My Mind, the love theme from Superman, features several configurations of the melody and strings. In this configuration, both violins one and two are in unison, and this particular transposition of the theme sits in a comfortable register for violins. Having both violin sections in unison creates a stronger overall sound with a greater ability to project over a dense or active accompaniment. The increase in violins also intensifies or magnifies some of the qualities of the instrument in this range. And the higher you go on the violin, the more piercing and intense the sound can get. So in this version, which happens towards the end of the cue, the melody is now shifted up so that the highest notes reach the extreme high part of the violin register. So the unison violins have a much more intense sound than the previous version. Williams obviously saves this configuration until the very end of the piece. It would be easy to overuse or overdo this range and intensity thus spoiling its effectiveness. So while having both violins in the highest register is one way to add intensity and strength, it's not the only way. As I've shown before in this video, simply doubling across octaves in the other strings can add strength. And if everyone's sitting in a very comfortable part of their range, one that's very lyrical and expressive, then the overall timbre won't sound strained or overly intense. In this configuration, the violins are in unison in the top octave, the violas are an octave below, 
and only half the cellos are an octave below that. Dividing the cello section in half is a common orchestrational tactic that both strengthens the theme and allows for a more active, low-string accompaniment texture in the lower division of the cellos. I'll finish this video by looking at the flying theme from E.T. Let's say you have a soaring melody similar to this one, and you're wanting to score it for strings throughout the course of a track or piece. In this transposition of the theme in C major, I can place the melody in violins near the top of their register. This is fairly high, nearing the top of their range, but for violins it's effective, especially at a climactic moment in a piece. An octave lower, violins will still be effective in this range, and now violas are effective as well, especially if one or both violin sections are positioned an octave above violas. While possible on cello, the highest notes of this melody extend into the extreme register of the cello, so I probably wouldn't have them on the melody in this octave. In the third octave, violins would be at the bottom of their register, which is more aggressive and darker in timbre. Not quite what you want for soaring string melodies. Both violas and cellos will work nicely here though. This is an especially good range for bright, expressive cellos. In this lowest octave here, only cellos are possible, although this is getting fairly low, and this register, like I said earlier, is usually reserved for accompanimental and bass notes. I would probably only have cellos here if you had all four octaves present. First violins on the top octave, then second violins, then violas, then cellos, like this. This is a really powerful sound, and this configuration does in fact appear in Williams's score. But the cellos will also be effective if placed an octave above where their timbre is brighter and more intense. Now the violas and cellos are in unison. The potential concern here would be overscoring that low octave. So you might consider moving the violas up an octave now to be in unison with second violins. That would strengthen the middle octave, and the cellos would have no problem being heard even if they're all alone on that lower octave. This is also one of the configurations in Williams' score, and this positioning of first violins at the top, second violins and violas in unison in the middle, and cellos below is one of the most common arrangements of strings on a soaring theme. Ultimately, there are many possible configurations, and which octave you place each section should always be dependent on the melodic range of the melody, as well as how intense or how strong the music needs to be in that particular moment. Always pay attention to the balance between octaves, and try not to overdo any one octave. Unless, of course, that's the exact sound that you're looking for. In a later video in this series, I'll write my own soaring theme and orchestrate it for the string section. I'll also discuss how to write accompaniments and counter melodies under the string theme, so stay tuned for that video. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.